So, it's been a long time in the making, but a few days ago, I got on a mass, grabbed my DJI Osmo, and set out to visit every single SkyTrain station in Metro Vancouver. The video, as I mentioned, has been long in the making, and while usually I would step out onto each station platform while riding around the system, I've chosen to stay seated at the front of each train I rode, most of which, I will add, were mostly empty. I'm also going to be narrating this video versus what I've done in the past to make this a bit more like a ride on the SkyTrain with Reese. so I hope you enjoy it. So ride along with me as we ride to every SkyTrain station in Metro Vancouver, seeing the incredible development along the way and pointing out points of interest. Now, as I left a friend's place to head to the SkyTrain at the beginning of this journey, I just wanted to point out how well elevated rail can blend in with the streetscape. The SkyTrain here is quieter than the road traffic and passes right above through the residential areas. This seems to be a major point of contention in Toronto with the Ontario line, but here all you see is beautiful greenery and the sleek, quiet trains passing by every few minutes. I think a lot of the issue is when people imagine elevated rail in Toronto, they think of the Chicago L. But seeing the SkyTrain guideways among the trees with numerous high-rises, I can't help but see a vision of an environmentally friendly and universally accessible future. Now, I'm starting this journey off at Berquitlam Station, though technically, since I'll be riding back through it, it's not our official starting point. I really like this station. It's simple, but open and functional. It also has one of these awesome bike parkades which have been installed at a number of rail stations around Metro Vancouver. Now since I foresee comments about it, the SkyTrain here and the first one I'll be riding purposely runs short and small two-car trains in order to provide more frequency. Transcend clearly understands the benefit of high-frequency rail, as even though the stations on the Expo Millennium division of the SkyTrain can support up to five-car trains, they instead run two-car trains every three minutes in the midday to provide a more convenient service. And it's practical, as the cost difference is negligible on an automated system. As we travel east towards the terminus at the core of the city of Coquitlam, we get views of the first of many massive tower clusters you'll see at a significant number of SkyTrain stations. This is something Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa really haven't done to nearly the same extent, and it probably is a big factor in why despite having quite a few less stations than these bigger systems, in Montreal and Toronto specifically, and smaller trains, Vancouver still carries around half as many riders every day. Speaking of Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa, I visited all the rapid transit stations in all of these cities, so if you haven't seen those videos, you should go watch them next. I'll link them in the cards. So, for the route I'll be taking today, we start at the northeastern terminus of the Millennium Line at Lafarge Lake Douglas Station, then ride the entire Millennium Line to the VCC Clark. We then jog one stop back to Commercial Broadway, my favorite transit station in North America, where we'll catch the busiest bus in the US or Canada, the 99B Line, Broadway Express over to Broadway City Hall Station on the Canada Line, before riding south to both Richmond and YVR Airport, which should be interesting, I haven't been to an airport in months before riding back north, switching to the Expo line at Waterfront, and riding it down to its terminus at King George, before heading back to ride the other branch to our finishing point at Logie Town Centre. We start our journey at 5.30pm, traveling south from Lafarge to Lincoln. Lincoln is basically a carbon copy of Berquitlam Station, and was funded by the Coquitlam Centre Mall in concert with the government. The station, which is a proper, fully accessible subway or metro station, costs less than $30 million to build, which in Canadian and Torontonian terms is unbelievable. To compare the stations on Toronto's Toronto York Spadina subway extension, cost up to $400 million a piece to build, and as those stations are deep underground, they're actually incredibly annoying to access, unlike the short Lincoln station. Now you might argue that those stations are larger and feature more amenities, but for the average rider, the difference probably wouldn't matter much, despite one station costing more than 10 times more to build, which is really the secret to how Vancouver has built such an extensive system. It's also fun to note that the distance between this station and Lafarge is only around 600 meters, one of the shortest in the network, but pretty common in other Canadian cities. One of the interesting points about the Evergreen Line is all the tight corners and weird track arrangements. This curve coming into Coquitlam Central is quite tight, and it shows one of the benefits of the Inovia Metro technology used in traditional SkyTrain. 
Despite the earth-shattering proposals in Toronto to run lighter metro trains next to heavy rail, this already happens, albeit with a little more distance, on the Evergreen Line, where much of the line runs adjacent to a freight right-of-way. This leads to one of the more interesting sections of the system and kind of answers the question what Vancouver stations would look like if it had electrified at-grade regional rail systems like in Europe or Asia. This section of the line also has the latest fad in Metro Railways, a two-track single-board tunnel. You also note the steep section leaving the Evergreen Line as trains approach Lowkey Town Centre Station. It's one of the steepest sections of track on the network, enabled by that centre rail, which Skytrains use to pull themselves along, sort of like a futuristic cog railway. Again, as we enter Lowkey, one of those very tight corners, so tight that the separate directions of travel are stacked, as you can see with the train going in the other direction. As we continue to travel along the Millennium Line, we pass through Production Way University Station, which is the future location of a gondola to Simon Fraser University, which is located up on the hill to the left. The various stations on the Millennium Line all have distinct designs. You'll also notice most have island platforms. This simplified construction, as the guideway did not need to split in two as frequently as you see on the Expo Line. Here you see the Brentwood area, which is an area which has recently seen massive development. The tall towers you see are among the tallest in British Columbia, and the redeveloped mall at their base is incredibly nice, reminding me of a big outdoor mall you might see in an Asian city. This might be the topic of a future video, so stay tuned. Here you can see the area around Gilmore. It's also become the site of tons of towers, with more tall ones being built directly next to the station. Nearby, we also cross BC Highway 1, one of the few places the Skytrain operates near a freeway. Notably, unlike several other cities in Canada, Skytrain does not and does not have plans for any extensions which operate in a freeway medium, which I like. You'll probably also notice the rail lines below. Lots of Skytrain lines operate near or above old or existing railway rights of way, moving in and out of them to hit key growth areas which keeps down costs. You'll notice though that in Vancouver, the conversation is usually less about hitting dense areas with new Skytrain lines, as usually Vancouver places its density where Skytrain lines and stations already exist, which is a model that sorely needs to be adopted in the rest of the country. It's also worth noting how great the views are on much of the Skytrain. As someone who commuted daily on the subway in Toronto, I found myself on my phone a lot more, as you really have nothing to do or to look at in much of the system, as well as in Montreal. This also meant making those all the stations videos were less fun. Great views are a huge benefit of rapid transit in Vancouver, especially if you're sitting in the front seat. As we approach the end of the line, the Millennium Line runs in an open cut below grade, above a freight and sometimes passenger rail line. Despite being called Skytrain, as you've already seen, lots of the system operates at or below grade. Leave a comment if you want me to make a video exploring exactly how much. Now, upon arrival at the very dead VCC Clark Station, there are only about two people at the entire station. I dip below the tracks and back up to head to Commercial Broadway. I could have stayed on the train as most turn back, but I don't really like taking the risk of having a train going and parking in the tail tracks. Getting stuck there is a fear I've had since I was a little kid. Strangely, this station separates each platform into its own fare paid zone, which leads to an annoying hit to the compass card as we switch platforms. I do it all for you guys. You can really see the common design language with all the Millennium Line stations, despite the different roof designs, though the newest stations on the Evergreen extension do feature automatic slowing escalators and both up and down, whereas these older stations usually only have up escalators. Once I'm up at platform level, I get back to the exact same train going east. I love the wayfinding on Skytrain by the way, it feels modern and very London inspired. In the future, the Millennium Line will be extended down Broadway, making this turnaround unnecessary. That project just had a bitter announce, so it's going to be getting built in the coming months. Stay tuned for another video on that. At Commercial Broadway, I hop off the train and take a look at the beautiful vine-covered platform wall before heading up some escalators through the concourse, past the new platform access before tapping out and heading to the 99 Beeline stop on Broadway, under the Expo line above. 
The station and streetscape are one of the few that really need more density around them, especially as it's such an important hub. So hopefully we see that soon. There's also trolley buses. Yay. As you can see, things are quite civilized for the 99 B-Line stop. There are painted queue lines for all three doors of the exclusively articulated buses which run here, as well as the huge shelters and lean bars. A lot of the articulated buses in Vancouver are these new hybrid ones from New Flyer. They're a lot better in terms of internal layout than the articulated buses I used to take frequently in Toronto. This bus weaves its way to Broadway City Hall quite quickly, though as I mentioned, this route will be converted to a subway soon enough. I even saw some signs for the project along the way. This is why the line was not converted to one of Vancouver's new BRT Lite rapid bus lines. One thing I really like is that when the door closes on one of Vancouver's express bus services, they use the same door closing chime as on the SkyTrain. Just another detail lacking from other Canadian transit systems, which I think sets Vancouver apart. I walk across the intersection to the Broadway City Hall Canada Line station. I still think a second entrance is a missed opportunity here. Even with the massive new subway being put in underneath the Canada Line, there are no plans for a second exit. However, the transfer will at least be better than this. The station, along with other stations on the line, has got new station signage in line with the rest of the network, which is an improvement over the old, very bland signage. I should also note my thoughts on the fare gates used here in Vancouver. I think similar ones are used in London and Sydney. They're a lot better than the flimsy affair in Toronto and Ottawa. Vancouver really does a lot of stuff well. What's cool about Broadway City Hall Station is, somewhat unique in Canada, you walk into the entrance off the street, turn a corner, and you can see the trains running below you, through these windows. It really shows the benefits of shallow, cut-and-cover stations, where you can get from the street to the trains incredibly quickly, and I feel like Broadway City Hall kind of feels like a mini Montreal metro station with its two-story internal space. Now, the discerning among you have probably noted that stations in Canada now legally need to have second exits for fire safety, so there are actually additional exits through the doors at the end of the platform. These really can't be converted to actual entrances though, they consist of somewhat narrow, unfinished stairwells like what you would see in a condo fire escape that lead to a single, one-way locked door at street level, and they're alarmed. Here you can also see another great feature of SkyTrain, which again, unlike Toronto, has most stations equipped with signs that show you the next several trains and their destinations, not just the next one, and in big, bright font. Here you can also see the lasers, which create an invisible wall, stopping trains if someone falls from the platform. You can also see where the wire runs down the middle of the track, which is used to monitor train location. The lack of a middle limb rail shows that unlike the Expo and Millennium Line, the Canada Line uses very big standard multiple unit trains, with just one power rail. The very bright headlights show us that we'll be on one of the new Canada Line trains. They're very similar to the existing ones, but with better lighting, and supposedly enhanced air conditioning. These trains were ordered to expand capacity on the line by increasing train frequency to sub every three minutes. Vancouver is quite cool in that there are four distinct rolling stock designs in operation, the most for a metro rail system in Canada. Riding again at the front of the train, you can take in a lot of the details of the infrastructure, from the switches to the signals and the expansion joints to other wayside equipment. It really helps you get a sense for the design considerations and engineering behind the system. As we exit the tunnel for the Canada Line, which again despite being called SkyTrain is tunneled for much of its length, we arrive at another crazy tower cluster. This one, another new site at Marine Gateway. You can also see that despite using traditional traction, these trains on the Canada Line still operate on tons of steep grades. Next up, we cross the North Arm Bridge into Richmond, which carries both Canada Line trains and a bike and pedestrian path. The SkyTrain system, much like the future Montreal REM, travels on several really grand bridges, though this one is somewhat unique as it uses an extra-dosed hybrid design which let it both provide high clearances for ships below and a low height as it's in the flight path of the YVR International Airport North Runway. Next, we pass through Bridgeport Station, on our way to Richmond, flying under the tracks to YVR. 
and heading on our way down number 3 road towards the terminus at Richmond Brickhouse Station. Despite being two cars long, the Canada Line trains have a lot of capacity, as they're much wider than the trains on the other parts of the SkyTrain network. There are also provisions for a third half-length car in the middle of the trains to grow capacity for the future, and despite the constant online talk of being underbuilt, most riders on the train just sit quietly, enjoying the high-quality service provided along the north-south axis of the region. Just as with the rest of the region, you'll notice tons of density popping up around the Canada Line through Richmond, though due to the proximity of the airport and the low-lying nature of the area, the style of the developments do tend to be different. Despite this, you'll notice the same high-quality stations including the beautiful wood elements common among many new SkyTrain stations across the network. As we approach the terminus, you'll notice that the Canada Line is single-tracked. This is much less of an issue than you might think, as the trains are precisely scheduled. Frequencies, even to these single-track terminus stations, tend to be better than many systems across North America, with trains roughly every five minutes. When we arrived at the terminus, the train was actually being taken out of service, and despite what automated rail detractors might say, this was not a complicated process. Two Canada Line employees asked any remaining passengers to disembark, then the next train screen marked the train is not in service, and once everyone was clear, the employees told the control center by radio to close the doors and have the train depart. Another awesome element present on the candle line are announcements in the stations, telling passengers where the next train is headed. This helps if things get crowded, but it also improves accessibility. Here's another look at those platform laser intrusion detectors I mentioned earlier. You can see the ones to the right point across the platform. Once again, as we travel north, we're given incredible views of the North Shore Mountains. It's really a treat. As we head back to Bridgeport, you can see the significant new development which has appeared in recent years both to the left and the right of the guideway on screen. You can also notice the straight section of track here and where the third rail switches size. Provisions were built into the system in numerous places for future add-on stations, and here developers have charged fees on the condos that they've sold to fund a new station here called Capstan Way. The station is set to get underway soon, and it shows that by having small, relatively inexpensive stations with frequent trains, it's really easy for developers to get involved in helping build out the network, which is something Vancouver has done far better than any other Canadian city. Here we fly back under the YVR tracks as we re-enter Bridgeport, where I'll hop on a train bound for the international airport. Unlike in Toronto and Montreal, as well as many other systems, Vancouver's flyovers are above ground, giving you a really good sense of the size of these incredible pieces of railway engineering. A great feature of Bridgeport on the Canada Line that's lacking at Columbia, the equivalent station on the Expo Line where the branches begin, is that it has an island platform. This means riders traveling from one of the branches to the other doesn't need to go up or down a set of stairs to access the trains traveling to the other branch, which is a good design and is great for convenience and accessibility. As we head on to Sea Island, where Vancouver's International Airport is located, you can see the towers of Marine Gateway to the left of the screen, and the Fraser River below. Up next on the left is a somewhat tacky European-themed outlet mall, by a European developer, mind you. The Canada Line is totally free to use on airport ground, and so those on a long layover can come do some shopping before hopping on their next flight. The airport is also relocating its long-term parking out here to the east of the main terminals. Now of course, yet again we see the SkyTrain running at ground level, this time to allow for a future elevated taxiway above. You can see lots of greenery as well as the mountains from these sections of the line, and I find it really beautiful. As it turns out, yet again, this section of the line was funded by the airport itself, which forces the airport to push riders to use it to its fullest, which has led to over 20% of airport traffic accessing it via the one rail line. 
The keen eyed among you might also notice that the airport stations have up and down escalators, which the airport wanted on its stations. Once again, we're on the single track guideway, heading to the terminus station of this branch at YVR Airport. You can see massive construction going on off to the right, constructing a new geothermal energy and utility building that will help keep YVR one of the most environmentally friendly airports in the world. You also see the massive new parking garage being constructed, which, while somewhat sad to see, will feature 10% EV charging on day one to cater to one of North America's largest EV markets. On our return to Bridgeport, we get to fly over the Richmond-bound tracks, now having ridden each one of these tracks in this junction. Leaving Bridgeport, we get to see one of the SkyTrain Network's three maintenance and operations centers, which like the one on the Millennium Line, has recently been expanded to accommodate the new Canada Line trains. This network is really growing like mad. Just like with other elements of the railway, being able to see the OMSF from above actually helps build the enthusiasm as well as get a better sense of how the railway operates. As we fly through the cut and cover tunnels under Campy Street, I pulled out my camera to show the point just south of Olympic Village Station where we entered the board tunnel under False Creek. You can tell this due to its circular shape. As it turns out, the distance between Olympic Village and Broadway City Hall is the shortest on the entire network, at only about 400 meters. As we pull into the Candleline platforms at Waterfront, you'll notice this station currently basically acts as a single track too. One platform is generally filled with a parked out-of-service train. You see lots of trains parked around in pocket and tail tracks on the SkyTrain network, which let the system rapidly cycle in trains to meet surges in demand or operational issues. Leaving the Canada Line platforms, we walk down a corridor in between the short tail tracks, which leads to the main hall of Waterfront Station. You'll probably notice this up and down escalators here. Translink has been installing them in key Canada Line stations, which were designed with space for their future installation. A lot of smart design decisions like this allowed for the low-cost miracle that is the Canada Line, a 19-kilometer subway or metro route for less than $3 billion which was completed months ahead of schedule. There are also hand sanitizer dispensers all over the system now. It's really been well managed. Now, Waterfront Station is not the size of Union or Gare Centrale, but it does feature lots of dining options. You'll notice that there isn't a single fair paid zone between the Expo and the Canada Line here. I have mixed feelings about this. While it does make the transfer a little slower, due to the geography, it's pretty unusual to transfer stations here, and this will be even more the case when the Broadway subway opens, which is connected to the rest of the network by in-fair paid zone transfers. Things could be better here, I suppose, but the track layout kind of makes it hard, as both the Expo and the Canada Lines are at similar elevations. Once into the Expo Line fair paid zone, you'll see access to the C-Bus, Vancouver's frequent passenger ferry, and the West Coast Express commuter train. There's work being done here on the Expo Line platforms, so I'm going to be taking a very old elevator down there today. Here on the Expo Line platforms, we see a four-car Mark II train in the new gray and blue livery, often known by enthusiasts as the Mark 2.5, as they feature LED maps inside much like the Toronto rocket trains, as well as updated interiors and better lighting, feeling quite similar to a Mark 3 train internally. So I hopped into the driver's seat of the train and took off towards King George Station, the Expo Line's Surrey Terminus. You can see above how this section of the Expo Line is actually under streets which are built on decking above. You can also see how the two tracks become vertically stacked as they enter the Dunsmuir Tunnel, an old freight tunnel which was converted to a stacked metro tunnel for SkyTrain. You can see the Burrard Station here, which is deep underground and one of Vancouver's original subway stations. As we exit the Dunsmuir Tunnel, we pass through Stadium Chinatown Station. The station has three platforms, and as I mentioned before, you often see trains parked on the third platform. This platform was also used to shuttle trains back and forth when the line originally opened. Vancouver has had a lot of different rail service patterns in the past, more so than other cities in Canada. 
It's much easier to change routings when it's simply a digital matter, and you don't need to manage training drivers and the like. This section of the expo line runs parallel before diving under the Georgia and Dunsmuir viaducts. I frequently used to see posts amazed at cities with train lines passing through buildings. Vancouver also has its own version of this just west of Main Street Station. Exiting Main Street Station to the east, you can turn left for views of Pacific Central Station, Vancouver's long distance bus and train station. Again, I really like that these services are mentioned in the station announcements, as it raises awareness to them. From here, you can take Amtrak trains to Seattle and Portland daily, as well as the Canadian Via train to Eastern Canada every three days. It's also kind of neat that, like Montreal, we have two mainline rail stations, though it would be kind of cool to have all services unified at Waterfront. This section of the SkyTrain runs on what's known as Terminal Avenue. This is the original section of SkyTrain built as a test track before Expo 86. I always feel a little uneasy on it, as it was not originally designed for the new larger Mark II and III trains, and needed to be retrofitted. Through this section, we turn off Terminal Avenue and you can actually see VCC Clark Station and the Millennium Line, which runs parallel, albeit below the Expo Line, all the way to Commercial Broadway. As you can see, the Expo Line flies over the Millennium Line and the Grandview Cut as we pull into Commercial Broadway Station, leading to the perpendicular arrangement here. As we leave Commercial Broadway, there's actually a service disruption. A train hits some sort of foreign object at one of the next stations, and so trains are single tracking around the affected area. This is where the automated and more modern design of SkyTrain really shows. While Toronto would have shut down an entire section of the subway network, trains are actually quickly routed around the issue on SkyTrain, though this does lead to some very interesting queuing where you can see just how tightly spaced automated trains can run. We're also greeted with more accurate sections. SkyTrain? More like Land Train. As we pass through these older stations, you probably notice the grating on the platform tracks. This is the older technology before platform intrusion detectors used lasers. The grates are pressure plates, and if you're riding the system in the winter, you'll see that trains are sometimes even operated by attendants, as snow has been known to wreak havoc on this system. Fortunately, snow is quite uncommon in Vancouver. As things mostly go back to normal to the east of Nanaimo Station, the train goes back elevated as we pass through the original SkyTrain TOD tower cluster, Metrotown. A number of very tall towers have gone up to the right of the guideway here, and it really gives the whole area a futuristic feeling. Passing Metrotown, we get to Royal Oak, where yet again there's a major tower cluster going up, and the Expo Line, being the oldest SkyTrain line, has tons of density along its length. As this section of the Expo Line is at quite a high elevation, with the previous sections being around 130 meters above sea level, other sections like those at Grade on the Evergreen Line are nearly at sea level. After passing Edmonds Station, the line is once again at grade as we pass below an enclosed section that reminds me of the enclosed sections on the Toronto Young Line. Following this, we pass by the original and largest OMSF on the SkyTrain network. A site adjacent to this was actually used by Bombardier to assemble some of the original Mark II trains. This site will be home to a big new control center for the Expo Millennium Lines, as the old one won't have the capacity for the Langley and Broadway extensions of the network. It's really cool to see all this growth. 
Next up, we begin to descend into New Westminster, which was the terminus of the original Expo Line segment built for Expo 86. There are more incredible views as with the rest of the Expo Line here, of areas south, as well as the islands and mountains in the distance, some of which are in the United States. The Skytrain has much wider station spacings than other metro systems in Canada, with on average one kilometer between stations. The section here between 22nd Street and New Westminster Station is among the longest, at over 2.6 kilometers. Once again, as we pull into the New Westminster waterfront, we're greeted with a tower cluster, and we run over a freight railway yard. This is a real rail fans paradise. I get off my train at New Westminster to switch to a train bound for Surrey, as things got mixed up in the disruption. This is a cool station with a mall built around it. Here you can get a closer look at the limb rail and the pressure plates. Unfortunately, luck is not on my side, and instead of a Mark III, I get on an old and somewhat loud Mark I train. These trains are still a big part of the Skytrain fleet, despite some of them being over 30 years old. Now, on my Surrey-bound train, we leave Columbia and head over the Sky Bridge, formerly one of the largest transit-exclusive bridges in the world. The rail deck on the bridge is very high, and provides really amazing views of the Fraser below, as well as the New Westminster waterfront. As we cross to the south side, you can see the largely industrial area north of Surrey Central, including an elevated rail line, which carries Amtrak trains from Seattle and Portland, as well as numerous freight trains. These tiny maps also give you a sense of how small the Mark I stock are. These trains are tiny. Passing Scott Road Station, you see one of the few TransLink stations with a fairly large surface parking lot. However, even here, work is underway to add density surrounding the station. Passing through Surrey Central, we get amazing views of the iconic Bing Tom designed library and Three Civic Plaza, Surrey's tallest skyscraper. Upon leaving Surrey Central, our train pulls into King George after passing by the Surrey Central bus terminal, SFU's growing Surrey campus, and the Central City Shopping Center. Now that we're at King George, I head down from the platform level to take a look at the adjacent developments. Surrey Central has grown into one of the largest tower clusters in Metro Vancouver, and features a diversity of hotels, commercial space, residential towers, and both Kwantlen and Simon Fraser University campuses. Here at ground level, you can also see a plaque commemorating the line's opening and a very cool trapezoidal coast capital building. As we loop around the front of the station, you can also see yet another plaza and bike parkade. These are an awesome addition and I really can't get enough of them. As we depart King George Station, you can see numerous construction cranes and the towers of Surrey Central. The city of Surrey wants this area to be Metro Vancouver's second downtown, and with the mixture of uses and more affordable pricing, I can really see it happening. This area is more than a cluster of mixed-use towers, and is growing faster than most other areas, including with some really unique buildings like the library and SFU Surrey expansion. Unfortunately, luck was not on my side, and I still was not able to get on a Mark III train leaving Surrey. Oh well. Here you can see something that's popping up more and more in areas where buildings are right next to Skytrain. This is a roof-style noise barrier. Not a bad thing, though I hope we don't see these too extensively in the future blocking our views. As we head down to Scott Road, we're granted with a dirty windshield and amazing mountain and skyline sunset views. It's called beautiful British Columbia for a reason. Leaving Scott Road, once again we cross the Sky Bridge. These shots really give you a sense of the massive scale of this bridge. Do 
you can also see the fully separated flyover junction provided here, which limits train conflicts between the two Expo Line branches. Finally, before I get off the train at Columbia, I get a quick shot of the LED map provided in the Mark 2.5 train. Unfortunately, unlike at Bridgeport, I'm forced to cross under the tracks to reach the outbound track at Columbia. This is fine for me, but would not be a great experience for someone who is mobility impaired. Besides this, as quite a busy station, a lot of folks who want to see TransLink do a very nice station upgrade here. However, the station's semi-below grade nature seems to be a bit of a barrier. As you can see, Columbia, as a major transfer point, has very nice new passenger info displays. Not only are these full color, but they include nice animations that show a lot of effort was put into their design. As you can see, most trains head to King George, as the Surrey branch has much more ridership. Nonetheless, a fairly high frequency of service is still provided to the less used low heat production way branch. Once again, despite being old, this station features great wayfinding, like these track level maps in the middle of the tracks showing possible destinations from this platform. You also notice that unlike in Toronto, Vancouver is very liberal with marking connections to other services, such as West Coast Express and Rapid Bus. This is a really common sense thing that is made easier by having a single agency dealing with all transit in the region. Despite not being able to get on one, I see a number of Mark III trains passing through. The train is lovely and builds on the Mark 2.5, with massive windows, a less angular shape, more information screens, and a fully articulated design. Finally, I hop on our mother Mark I train, which brings me back once again to the Scarborough RT in Toronto and what it could have been. I walk to the front car and hop in the lovely jump seat after admiring the UTDC badge at the front. Here you can see another view of the Skybridge flyover, and one of the most roller coaster like sections on the whole network, which takes us up into yet another tunnel before we emerge onto the banks of the Fraser and a beautiful view of the river and the mountains. Here we pull into Sapperton, a cool station with bridge access as it's elevated above the freight corridor below. Sapperton is also the location of TransLink's headquarters, allowing them to keep an eye on the SkyTrain below. Next up we have Braid Station, the Bessarion of Vancouver. Surrounded by a highway, freight rail lines, and warehouses, many have suggested this station is simply a figment of our collective imagination. I myself am not so sure. Finally, after leaving Braid, the line runs adjacent to Highway 1 before flying over to follow North Road, opposite to the steep section of the Evergreen extension I mentioned before. As we approach Lohi Town Center, you can once again see the massive number of towers going up, as the old shopping mall here is redeveloped into a high-density mixed-use town center of sorts, right near one of the most important rail stations in the region. And with that, we pass through a flat junction east of Lohi Town Center. This trip to all the stations took around 4 hours from start to finish. That's a pretty excellent time in my books, given I didn't pre-plan the route to be optimal and I got caught in a few weird service hiccups. Fortunately, the service here is designed to offer convenient cross-platform transfers, so only a couple seconds later, my Millennium Line train arrives to take me off into the sunset. I hope you all enjoyed my video. If you want to see us visit all the stations and cover more stations in detail, make sure you subscribe and stay tuned to the channel. Thanks!